So now let's take a look into the histology of osseous tissues. Like any other connective tissue, bone consists of cells, fibers, and ground substance. There are four principal types of cells in bones. There are osteogenic cells or osteoprogenitor cells. There are osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Now, these roots are going to come up over and over. Osteo will always refer to bone. Blasts will always refer to cells that make something. Sites will always be the mature version of the cell. And clasts will always break stuff down. So if we changed it to myocytes, that would mean mature cells in the muscle tissue. But here we're looking at osteo. So osteogenic or osteoprogenitor cells are found in the endosteum and the periosteum. So those are the membranes around the outside of the bone, as well as the membrane that lines the marrow cavity. And it's found in the central canals of the osteum. They arise from embryonic mesenchymal cells, and they multiply continuously to produce new osteoblasts. So here we have an osteogenic cell, and it will become an osteoblast will give rise to many, many osteoblasts, and the osteoblasts will eventually become mature osteocytes. So the osteoblasts are the actual bone-forming cells. They line up as a single layer of cells under the endosteum and periosteum, and they're non-mitotic, so they won't divide again. The only source of osteoblasts is osteogenic cells. They'll synthesize the soft organic matter of the matrix, which then hardens by mineral deposition. Now, stress on the bone, such as little fractures or weight-bearing exercise, will stimulate the osteogenic cells to multiply more rapidly and increase the number of osteoblasts to reinforce or rebuild bone. The osteoblasts also secrete a substance called osteocalcin. This is thought to be one of the structural proteins of bone. It stimulates insulin secretion from the pancreas and increases the sensitivity of adipocytes to insulin. And thus, it'll limit the growth of the adipose tissue. Now, osteocytes used to be osteoblasts. They're now trapped in the bony matrix that they themselves deposited when they were osteoblasts. The osteocytes live in little cavities. Those little cavities are called lacunae. Lacunae means little lakes. Each of these lacunae are connected to each other by little canals or canaliculi. That way, we can have constant communication between the osteocytes. You'll notice the osteocytes have a lot of projections. We'll see where those projections come into play shortly. Sometimes we'll see the osteocytes reabsorbing a little bit of bone matrix, and sometimes we'll see them depositing it. They contribute to the homeostatic mechanism of bone density and calcium and phosphate ions. We'll look into this in more detail later. When osteocytes are stressed, they'll produce biochemical signals that regulate bone remodeling. Remodeling is similar to what you would do in a house, taking out old stuff and putting down new stuff. Now, osteoclasts are bone-dissolving cells, and they are not in the same lineage as this osteogenic cell, osteoblast, osteocyte development. The osteoclasts come from stem cells that are found in the bone marrow, the same ones that give rise to blood cells. These cells are unusually large, and they're formed from the fusion of several different stem cells. You can see several different stem cells coming together here to form this very large osteoclast cell. 
They have a ruffled border on them. This ruffled border is the side that's facing the bone. And they're literally folds in the plasma membrane that aid to increase the surface area of the cell and thus the reabsorption efficiency. Now these cells lay on the surface of the bone in an area called a resorption bay or howship lacunae. They actually form pits on the surface of the bone. The osteoclasts are heavily involved in the process of bone remodeling. They're going to be doing the dissolving part. They actually secrete chemicals that dissolve the bone right at this brush border and they reabsorb the components of the bone. Maybe it's because we need to release some calcium into the blood. So they're breaking down some bone to take calcium into the cell and then get the calcium out into circulation. So that covered the cells of osseous tissue. Now the matrix of the osseous tissue. It's about one-third organic and two-thirds inorganic matter by dry weight. The organic component is synthesized by the osteoblasts. This is material like collagen, carbohydrate and protein complexes such as glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and glycoproteins. It's also composed of inorganic matter. 85% is hydroxyapatite, which is crystallized calcium and phosphate salt. So hydroxyapatite is a combination of both calcium and phosphate. There's 10% calcium carbonate. And then there are some other minerals, such as fluoride, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. So bone is a composite of two basic structural materials, a ceramic and a polymer. So it combines the optimal mechanical properties of each component. It's sort of like if we're building a big concrete building, then there's going to be a lot of rebar. The rebar has a little bit of flexibility, and then we pour concrete into a form around the rebar so that it makes the rebar not quite as flexible. Bone's very similar. The organic matter, the collagen and these carbohydrate protein complexes, form sort of the rebar structure. It's soft and bendable. And then we fill it in with inorganic ma matter, like the concrete. Here, in this case, mostly calcium and phosphate with calcium carbonate and these other minerals. That firms up the structure. So if there's a deficiency in either the organic part or the inorganic part, we're going to see different effects in the skeleton. Rickets is a condition of soft bones. This is when you have enough of the organic matter, the rebar structure, yet not enough of the inorganic cement type matter. And so the bones are soft and a little bit bendy. Osteogenesis imperfecta is the opposite of that. We have not enough of the rebar, right, the collagen and the proteins that maintain some bendability to the structure and plenty of the inorganic matter. So the bones tend to break very easily because there's not enough structural portion of the matrix. So take a moment here to pull out a piece of paper and outline all the different components of bones histology. We'll begin with the different types of cells of osseous tissue. And then what are the main components of the matrix? Remember the matrix is divided into two portions, the organic portion or the bendy collagenous rebar type portion and the inorganic concrete or calcium phosphate portion. And now we'll move in to looking at how it all comes together. As you learned in our section on tissues, the main unit of compact bone is the osteon or, or the herversian system. So here you can see an osteon. The osteon is the basic structural unit of compact bone. It's formed by a central canal and then several concentric lamellae. 
the lamellae are these different layers that we see here. You can see lamellae all around a central canal. They're connected to each other by canaliculi. The canaliculi are the little stripes here between the lamellae. Within the central canal, you'll find blood vessels and nerves. Also, you'll see perforating or Volkmann's canals. They are transverse or diagonal passages along the length of the osteon, bringing blood into each of the different osteons. The skeleton receives about half a liter of blood each minute. The blood vessels will enter into the perforating canals through the nutrient foramina. They allow them to cross the matrix and feed the central canals of all the different osteons in the bone. The osteocytes you can see here live in these little lacunae, as we said. So you can see the outline of the lacunae here and then a cell, the lighter brown colored structure inside the little lake. And it has lots of little projections. These projections go out through the canaliculi so that each cell can communicate with the neighboring cells. You can see, although this is spongy bone, you can see the idea here where you have a little osteocyte inside a lacunae and each of its projections are reaching out through these little canaliculi, the little canals in the bone, so that this cell might be able to talk to this cell. In this way, the cells can communicate. They're connected to each other by gap junctions, and they'll not only receive nutrients from their neighboring cells, but pass waste back to them. And those osteocytes that are closest to the blood vessels will be the ones that are receiving the nutrients first. This way, each of the cells has a two-way flow of nutrients and waste into and out of the cells. So it goes from the blood vessel to the osteocytes closest to the central canal. And then it gets passed, literally, from cell to cell through gap junctions that connect the cells. And the cells can connect to each other by sending out projections through the little canaliculi. The cells are arranged in layers called lamellae, and the canaliculi span from one lamellae to the next lamellae. Not all of the matrix, however, you'll notice, is arranged into osteons. Although the osteon is the basic unit, there's some space here that doesn't have the same circular arrangement. These are called interstitial lamellae in this area. They're the remains of old osteons that have been broken down as the bone grows and remodels itself. We'll also see around the very edge of the bone, circumferential lamellae. They go around the whole circumference of the diaphysis of the bone and run parallel to the bone surface. Here again, you can see a little bit more detail on the blood vessels in the bone. You can see that the perforating canals make their way to the central canals. The nutrient foramina or the holes in the outside that the perforating vessels will go into. You can also get a good vision here of the circumferential lamellae. Here's an osteon. Each of these little dots is an osteocyte residing in a lacunae connecting to other osteocytes through their canaliculi. And we'll also see the interstitial lamellae between each of these circular osteons. Spongy bone is a little bit different in that it has the appearance of sponginess. It's not dense. Down here in the bottom portion of the picture, this is the spongy bone. The spongy bone consists of trabeculae, these projections. And these trabeculae have a structure very similar to the osteon, but they lack a central canal. The spaces between the trabeculae are filled with red bone marrow. So most of the blood cells are produced in here. They do have the same arrangement of osteocytes in lacunae, forming a lamellar layer. And each of these lamellar layers talk to each other through canaliculi. 
Now, in spongy bone, trabeculae will develop along the bone's lines of stress. So if we look at this picture, you can see the main lines of stress in the bone. And you'll notice that the trabeculae are aligned along those lines of stress. This makes the bone be much more strong along the lines that receive the most stress. Okay, it's time to diagram again. This time, we're highlighting an osteon as a component of a piece of compact bone. The things that you'll need to include are the osteocyte, the lamellae, the canaliculi, the central canal, some circumferential lamellae, as well as some interstitial lamellae. Perhaps you might identify perforating canals also. And then you'll want to diagram some spongy bone. Show me the trabeculae of spongy bone and their lacunae and canaliculi and lamellae and osteocytes. On these diagrams, you may also add in where you most likely see osteoclasts and where you see osteoblasts. At least think about it so that you can put it all in perspective. Now we'll move on and talk about bone marrow. Bone marrow is a general term for this soft tissue that occupies the marrow cavity of a long bone and the small spaces between the trabeculae of spongy bone. There's two types of marrow. There's red marrow and yellow marrow. Red marrow or myeloid tissue is in nearly every bone of a child. This is the hemopoietic tissue. That means it produces blood cells and it's composed of multiple tissues that are in a delicate but intricate arrangement. This is an organ in itself. In adults, we primarily find this red marrow in the skull, in the vertebrae, in the ribs, in the sternum, and in parts of the pelvic girdle and the proximal heads of the humerus and femur. All these areas are shown in red. Yellow marrow is found only in adults. In adults, most of the red marrow in the long bones is going to turn into a fatty yellow marrow. This fatty yellow marrow no longer produces blood. It's the marrow you're probably familiar with seeing in a long bone that you might give to a dog. Often it's the femur cut into sections and you can see that fatty yellowish material in the center that they love so much. So that brings us to the end of this section of lecture. We'll move on next to bone development, but be sure to spend some time with these diagrams here while this material's fresh in your brain, because this is part of the diagramming assignment for this chapter's material.